And now we come to, um, well, we welcome uh, Salvatore uh, Vitale uh, in the paper in conjunction with uh, Chris Hale, Alendis van der Martel, Michael D, Nicholas Thurman, and yes, and that's it. Uh, entitled, it's absolutely relative, the LH1 stratigraphic and ceramic sequences from Mitru and their 14C anchor points. Hello. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues. Before we begin, we would like to thank Jan and Tiziana for organizing this important event. It is a pleasure to be here, and we hope that what we share with you tonight makes a good addition to the simulating workshop. Now, Located in the North Euboean Gulf in central Greece, Mitru is a partially submerged telt site, which was excavated from 2004 to 2008 by the University of Tennessee and the effort of Theotida and Evritania. Through these investigations, we uncover a virtually uninterrupted stratigraphic sequence ranging from EH to B to the LPG phase. Today, we focus on the LH1 period at the site in an effort to contribute to the ongoing debate on the relative and absolute chronologies of this phase in which the Theron eruption occurred. To do so, we discuss Mitra's stratigraphy and pottery sequence, as well as a series of eight, mostly short-lived C14 samples ranging in date from final image to the end of LH2A. Within this time span, our study, identif um, our study identified no less than 23 stratigraphic levels, nearly all representing architectural phases, but also including a few burial phases. Despite the small sample of our C14 data set, Mitra's rich sequence allows us to propose some interpretation that are relevant, we think, to the subject of this workshop. First, we argue that LH1 was a very long phase, including at least 16 architectural levels, and perhaps being even longer than the 100 to 110 years recently proposed by Wiener. Second, our pottery analysis provides the richest LH1 sequence for central Greece and demonstrate the existence of two LH1 subphases, which have good correlations with other major sites on the Greek mainland and the wider Aegean. Combined with our C14 samples, our stratigraphic and ceramic sequences support a date within the 16th century BCE for the end of LH1, as well as for the Theron eruption. In the course of LH1, Mitru was transformed from a presumed fairly egalitarian and mage settlement into a hierarchical settlement with elite complexes, an array of wide paved roads and elite tombs. This was a period of significant architectural activity resulting in a stratigraphic sequence of 16 purely LH1 levels, which also included some 20 grades. As many as nine levels can be assigned to the LH1 early ceramic subphase and seven levels to, L to the LH1 late subphase. In LH1 early, building age complex located in the Northwest um, excavation area, had six architectural phases and one burial phase. In the Northeast excavation area, building U and its predecessor, building T, had six architectural phases and two burial phases. The LH1 early levels for building U, H, U, and T could be synchronized to some extent by their pottery characteristics, resulting in nine stratigraphic levels site-wide. In LH1 late, um, building H had six additional architectural phases and at least one burial phase. Building D in the Northeast sector had two architectural phases which were synchronized with those of building H. The LH1 phase at Mitru is framed between a final MH horizon and six LH2A architectural phases. At the eastern sea scarp, our final MH level was succeeded by a pattern's kiln of final MH or uh, LH1 early date, which in turn was stratified below the first floor of building S dated to LH1 early. The LH2A phase, on the other hand, contains stratigraphic level 17 to 22. 
level 17 may have begun in LH1 late, but it also includes LH2A contexts. Based on site stratigraphy, the study of Mitra ceramic produced a detailed pottery sequence. After the end of a mage, both LH1 and 2A can be further subdivided into discrete early and late subphases. In the following discussion, we concentrate primarily on LH1, which is more relevant to the subject of this workshop. While Mitra's LH1 early and late pottery was found throughout the site, the sequence is best preserved in building H, where all subdivisions are found in multiple superimposed sealed deposit, deposits. The study of this material is based on a quantitative approach which focuses on three features, pottery classes, vessel shapes, and decorative treatments. Mitra's LH1 early sub pottery subface is defined by major developments in both unpainted and painted classes. In the fine unpainted fraction, fully oxidized fine unpainted pale pottery dominates the assemblage, marking a dramatic reversal from the preceding and mage final subphase, when fully reduced gray medium pottery was the most common tableware class. In the painted fraction, LH1 early is characterized by the first appearance of the ocean bikram alongside the already established mud painted class. Another significant shift is a remarkable drop in the quantity and diversity of imports, most notably can. Turning to typological trends, a major LH1 early development is the appearance of fine unpainted pale goblets with strap handles that are not high swung. Other new drinking shapes include vafi or straight-sided cups and semi-globular cups in both matte painted and fine unpainted pale classes. At least one of the matte painted vafio cups is likely an archive import. Changes in local drinking assemblage, in the local drinking assemblage, are completed by the appearance of the ocean bikram and matte painted cra craters. By Mitra's LH1 late subphase, straight-sided and semi-globular cups are firmly established, while goblets now have short stems. Craters show a more pronounced rim undercut compared to their LH1 early predecessors, a rim type which now also appears on narrow neck closed shapes. The fine unpainted pale class extends its dominance, while reduced fire classes under uh, reduced fire classes undergo a further decrease. The most significant LH1 late chronological marker at the site, however, is the introduction of small quantities of Mycenaean lustrous decorated pottery. Represented shapes in this new class include vafia and strat sided cups, as well as small closed shapes such as alabastra and squat jugs, decorated with motifs that have no antecedent at Mitru, such as reed and variegated stone patterns. Macroscopic fabric analysis and stylistic examination indicate that most of LH1 late Mycenaean decorate, lustrous decorated pottery at Mitru was likely imported from the Argolith. Nevertheless, a few fragments suggest the possibility of some local experimental vessels. <laughs> the end of LH1 late at Mitru sees the introduction of local cooking pots with bottom bases, as well as of Egynetan cooking pottery. Together with the preliminary identified Argaia vessels, this implies new preferences at the, sites, at the site in terms of pottery imports. Mitra's LH1 early and late ceramic subphases can be correlated with other major deposits from the Greek mainland and the Cyclades, thanks to several recent contributions provided, among others, by Dickinson, Dietz, Lindblom, Lolos, and Raptor. These studies indicate the existence of three separate stages in the development and the spread of Mycenaean lustrous decorated pottery during LH1. In the first, a few Minoan derived shapes such as Vafio and semiglobular cups were produced perhaps on Kithira and or somewhere in southern Laconia. At this early stage, these shapes had a limited distribution, mostly traveling alongside the traditional routes across which MH lustrous decorated vessels had previously reached Messenia and the Northeast Peloponnese. 
During the second stage, a workshop manufacturing the new Mycenaean lustrous decorated class was established in the Argolid, probably including Southern Peloponnesian and or Kytherian potters. This shift prompted the gradual introduction of some small clothes shapes uh, with no minor background, such as piriform jars, alabastra, and squat jugs. This expanded archive manufacture assemblage soon began to spread beyond the areas traditionally reached by NH lustrous decorated vessels. The third and final stage of LH1 marked an increased distribution of the new argolid based Mycenaean style. Some innovations, which represent 2A forerunners, such as piriform jars with hatch loop decoration, appeared now. Based on his work at Zungiza, Rutter recently proposed that the transition from the first to the second stage in the development of the Mycenaean style should be taken as the, as the border between early and late LH1. Rutter suggested chronology matches well with Mitra's sequence. Mitra's LH1 early uh, subface uh, lacks Mycenaean lustrous decorated vessels as the site was never reached by MH lustrous decorated pottery. On the other hand, Mitrus and Zungiza's uh, LH1 early deposit are linked by several parallels. Most obvious is the occurrence of matte painted Vafio cups, some of which may be our guide imports at both sides. Additional shared features between Mitrus and Zungiza's LH1 early deposits include mud painted and unpainted semiglobular cups, as well as uh, bichrome painted and unpainted goblets and or cantheroi. Other significant assemblages from the Greek mainland and the Cyclades approximately dating to this early LH1 horizon include deposit Zeta and Eta at Kestri on Kithira, Lola's Horizon 1 in Messenia, the destruction of Room 18 from early period 6 at Aguirini, and perhaps the pottery from Akrotiri's seismic destruction on Thera. Mitrus LH1 late subphase overlaps with both the second and the first stages of the development of Mycenaean pottery, as shown by the occurrence at the site of the wide and argolid based repertoire, including both open and small closed shapes, such as Alabastra. As previously stated, at Mitru, most of these vessels are likely our guide imports. The pottery from Akrotiri's volcanic destruction must be placed somewhere toward the end of the second stage of the development of the Mycenaean style, or slightly later, as it lacks any LH2A for runners. At Mitru, the same chronological horizon as that of the Akrotiri's volcanic destruction may correspond to that represented uh, in the uh, site stratigraphic level 12 or slightly later. This interpretation is supported by internal pottery shifts that mark the transition from the initial to the final development of LH1 late at the site. Besides Mitru and Thera, Lolo's Messinian horizons two and three approximately overlap with the second and first stages of the development of the Mycenaean lustrous decorated style that is to LH1 late. The same possibly applies to Lerna's shaft grades one and two. Finally, at the Ghiarini on Kea, the late phase six deposit from room 38 may also belong to LH1 late. A lengthy discussion of Mitrus LH2A pottery is beyond the scope of this paper. The following brief overview is intended as an outline to support the stratigraphic sequence presented previously. Four significant features identify Mitrus 2A pottery assemblage. The first is the continuous decrease of the gray minion tradition. The second is the virtual disappearance of biochrom bi bio bio bicrum and mud painted vessels, which dominated LH1 painted ceramics. The first is the, is the significant growth uh, in the occurrence of all functional classes of Aginitan imports. The four characteristic features feature is the remarkable increase of Mycenaean lustrous decorated pottery, which now constitute almost the entire fine painted fraction at Mitru. While most of the material consists of possible archive imports, sometimes of excellent quality, locally made Mycenaean lustrous decorated vessels are now well represented. 
The main typological and decorative development conform to archaic trends, including the first appearance of pattern rounded alabastra, shallow cups, and goblets, as well as that of marine and floral motifs. A leach to a late pottery, a leach to a late pottery at Mitsu is marked by the appearance of two experimental Ephyrian goblets featuring a rare argonaut with two coils instead of the canonical three, as well as the use of vertical chevrons as the main motif. This late stage of 2A at Mitru matches level nine, maybe, in the East Ali stratification at Koraku, but certainly the end of period 7B in House A at Aguirrini, the end of the Lebanon 1B phase at Castri and Kithira, and again, certainly the end of Trianda 2A on Rhodes. Now, the context and the dates of the C14 samples. For the phases relevant to this paper, uh, thus far, we submitted eight C14 samples, one dating to final MH and seven dating to LH1 and 2A. Our five chart seed samples were processed at the Center for Isotope Research at the University of Groningen, while our two human bone samples were dated by Beta Analytic in the US. Our first sample is a seed found within Hearth 4 of the second architectural phase of building S. This structure was built at the end of the MH period at Mitru, which is MH2 final slash MH3. The two sigma calibrated range for this sample is 1867 to 1627 BCE with a 91% probability between 1770 and 1627. Our second sample was a child's bones from uh, uh, a child's bone from cis grave 23 in building gauge, which can only be dated stratigraphically. This grave had been set into a floor of LH1 early level 4, and it had been covered with a floor of level 10 dated to LH1 late. Thus, this sample is best dated late in LH1 early or early in LH1 late. Stratigraphically, it could belong anywhere between levels 4 and 10. The two sigma temporal range for this sample is 1746 to 1547 BCE with a 96.4% probability between 1746 and 1609. Our first sample is one of several charred, bar charred uh, barley seeds found in the fill of a pebble and clay surface in space H11 belonging to the last LH1 level, number 16. Alternatively, it might have been uh, lying on the previous surface, which was constructed in LH1 late level 14. It cannot be determined whether it belonged to a gradual accumulation or a one-time fill. In any case, this sample can be approximately placed in the last half of Mitra's LH1 late uh, subphase or the last quarter of LH1. Thus, in our sample, it is the closest to a fear and destruction. The two sigma range for this sample is 1687 to uh, 1533 BCE. Our fourth C14 sample is problematic. It was found in the field of cis gray 41 together with some other 40 char seeds. And this cis gray belongs to stratigraphic level three dated to LH1 early. However, this sample C14 date is very late with a two sigma range of 1511 to 1431 BCE. It is possible that the seeds fell from the scarp above it, which had been undercut by the excavator to fully expose the grave. If so, uh, they could have come from the LH to a early cover of the tumulus belonging to level 17, or from the fill of an even later pit dug deeply into the tumulus. We certainly realize the risk of circular reasoning here. And as you can see, we're being very uh, uh, open in presenting our stratigraphy. However, this sample fits well in our uh, 2A chronological series, which is mostly made up of samples from good contexts, and incorporating it in our presentation does not really change our absolute date ranges. Our fifth sample 
uh, was one of several charred uh, acorn seeds found either inside the cover layer of tumulus free or in the adjacent earthen uh, pebble and earthen end pebble alleged to a surface because the two contexts were excavated together. This uh, sample thus belongs in level 17 early in LH2A. Its two sigma range is 1519 to 1437 BCE. The fact that the C14 date of this sample is almost identical to our previously discussed problematic for sample confirms that the latter most likely dates to LH2A. Our sixth sample is also somewhat problematic. It is an infant Urmeris from pit grave 43. This grave had been constructed in level 15, one of the last LH1 late levels. However, in LH2A level um, 19, the grave had been reopened and possibly reused. The two sigma range for this sample is 1498 to 1319 BCE with a 92.6 probability between 1498 and 1386. This date uh, might suggest uh, that this bone had been deposited in the grave in LH2A level 19. However, this 14 sample remains problematic as its late date, um, uh, its late final date could mean that it had been introduced during an even later episode of contamination. Our seventh sample consists of two charred anchor seeds found within a surface in space eight, uh, H11, belonging to LH2A uh, stratigraphic level uh, 19, while our eighth and final sample uh, comes from within a later earth in the same space, belonging to the last LH2A level, that is number 22. The two sigma ranges for these samples are almost identical at 1530 to 1439 and 1533 to 1443 BC, respectively. In addition to providing individual dates for a sample, we also present here a very tentative Bayesian model for both LH1 and 2A. The model is problematic because of the very limited current quantity of sample. And this is true, especially for LH1, which is represented by only two samples, one dating to roughly the middle of LH1 and another dating to roughly the last quarter of LH1 based on meter stratigraphy. With this caution in mind, or this warning, if you will, our Bayesian model sets the start of LH1 between 1738 and uh, 1551 BCE with a two sigma probability. For LH2A, our Bayesian model sets the start of this phase most likely at 1530 and 1468 with a two sigma probability. If we exclude from the model our two problematic samples, number four and six, however, then the beginning of LH2A ranges between 1550 and 1469 with a two sigma probability. Now to uh, discussion and conclusions. The extremely detailed stratigraphic and ceramic sequences presented in this paper show for the first time the existence of two separate LH1 and 2A ceramic subfaces in central Greece. They also provide a solid benchmark to correlate LH1 and 2A developments across this region, the Saronic Gulf, the Peloponnese, and the wider Aegean. In this context, we are now able to better understand how Mitru and Central Greece were gradually integrated into the formation process of Mycenaean culture. Our work also helps to better anchor the relative placement of the theorem eruption, which occurred at a mature stage of the LH1 subphase, perhaps contemporary with Mitru LH, uh, um, with, with Mitru LH1 late level 12 or slightly later. In contrast with relative chronology, because of the limited number of our current samples, at the moment, we cannot draw fine-grained conclusions about the absolute chronology of the theorem eruption. Despite this limitation, we still believe that our results have three noteworthy implication, implications. To begin, the combined dates of our first three samples assignable to final MH and LH1 suggest that LH1 most likely began in the 17th century BCE. This conclusion is especially corroborated by our second sample. 
Stratigraphically, this bone and its grave belong either to the later part of a late one early or the beginning of a late one late. In absolute terms, this bone has a 96.4 likelihood to date from 1746 to 1609 BCE. The C14 date, in combination with our stratigraphic sequence, indicate a start uh, uh, that for a uh, start for LH1 well before 1609 BCE and perhaps around the middle of that century or uh, slightly earlier. The second implication of, of, of our C14 result is that LH1 must have been a long phase. None of our LH2A samples, even those from the earliest LH2A at the site, can date earlier than 1533. And our limited Bayesian model sets the earliest possible date for the beginning of LH2A at 1530 or less likely 1550 with a 95.4 uh, uh, likelihood. Combined with an early to mid 17th century beginning for LH1, our absolute dates for LH2A uh, imply that LH1 was a long phase in the order of 130 to 50 years at the obviously at the widest range. A long duration for LH1 is also strongly indicated by our 16 stratigraphic levels and two ceramic subphases in this period. Now, the third and final implication of our C14 results concern, although indirectly, the absolute date of the Theron eruption. With LH2A beginning at the earliest in the middle uh, or in the fourth quarter of the 16th century, and the eruption dating in ceramic terms around the middle of LH1 late, we find it difficult to support a 17th century date for this crucial event. All other dates within the 16th century are pot potentially com compatible with our data set. A 16th century date for the eruption is supported by our third sample, uh, dating to the last quarter of LH1 and having a latest possible date of 1533 BCE with a two sigma probability. A 16th century date for the eruption is also in harmony with both of our Bayesian models, which, which set the earliest beginning of LH2A either at 1550 or most likely at 1530 BCE. Thank you very much for your attention. There we are. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Salvatore. The most extraordinary thing, I think, in a sense, um, from the evidence that um, you presented, uh, is uh, not only the length of um, LH1 um, at your site, but how early uh, it began. Looking from a Cretan point of view, I mean, just to make make it uh, um, state the obvious, you know, it's difficult for many of us to see uh, late my known one beginning much before 1600. Yeah, yeah. I mean... Uh, I that, that, anyway, carry on. No, please, did you... No, no I finished. Ah. <laughs> well, uh, sure, uh, we see that. Uh, one point is also, uh, I guess, synchronizing the labeling here, the labels. I think that our, uh, we, we think, I don't know, and, and Chris, please, uh, if you want to say something, um, speak as well as a co-author of the paper uh, and the others too from home. Well, uh, we think that there might be some overlap uh, at the beginning of our uh, early phase uh, with what other people call the end of the Middle Bronze Age. But uh, certainly we think that the end of it goes uh, into what we suggested as uh, the, the, the synchronous we, we think are, are valid. Um, I'll find out something to add to that. Um, obviously, it would be very interesting to know what um, comes out of the Kelowna uh, uh, C14 sequence once it's been recalibrated against the new, new calibration curve, because I think you guys have a really, really solid boundary for the start um of uh of, of this of this period in question so uh com corresponding that with what we have will be very useful in the future i think yeah. <clears throat> malcolm uh, speak forever hold your peace salvatore thank you very much salva uh, can you just clarify for us whether the 
radiocarbon measurements were based on the now discredited uh, uh, decadal calibration curve or on the new 2020 annual calibration curve? Oh, the last one. Uh, it was in the slide. It was said in the slides. Uh, it was written very in very small characters, but yes, the last one, the 2020. Yeah. Obviously, I'm not a specialist of radiocarbon date, and we try to make our best yeah. to use the dates. Yeah. Mm. Uh, that goes to, to, to reply to Salva and Chris's comment. The Colonna boundary between what we call the late Middle Bronze Age and the beginning of the Late Bronze Age was defined by four stratigraphic samples. And as we are aware of the four, the four samples may not be enough, mm. this was the reason why we would like to do an additional series of stratified samples that start in the late middle bronze age and reach up to late bronze age too yeah uh, as i i i hope it was clear that we have potentially several other samples that we could uh date in the future which will certainly make our uh c14 data set uh more performing and more uh, trustworthy um, Thanks for the possibility to have yet another comment. Um, this is uh, Bernie Benninger. Bernie Benninger. I'm very fascinated, first of all, and wonderful. And this is the first time I've ever seen this sort of stuff that you have a, a stratified sequence of radiocarbon samples. You have an age depth model, you have 25 so we call it strata layer levels. Just to just, 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 uh, to put this into perspective, my experience with tell sites, this is not a tell them study, is that. Um, these things, every every architecture, lots of architecture develops one centimeter. Then you have approximately one meter, that's 100 years. But I don't even need that. I've been doing wiggle matching, metric wiggle matching in my mind, normally do with computer few hours. And I think that um, Malcolm's going to be very happy with the results when, when we get it through the, the Monte Carlo wiggle matching. You have for each sample, you have um, a layer and you have a plus minus. This is exactly what we need for metric Monte Carlo wiggle matching. And I've been doing it in my mind these hundred years will give us something like a transitional. The trouble is, I, I don't know whether some to the eruption is, but if you say it somewhere in the last third or it will be where Malcolm wants it. Yeah, okay, in my mind, this is a forecast. Yeah, Malcolm is correct. Thanks. <laughs> Malcolm, carry on. <laughs> I'm sorry, I wasn't able to hear all of the last uh, comment. Um, uh, by the way, I've always wanted to start LH1 around 1630 BC, but uh, I'm wondering at the, at the site of Mitru, it's now, as you pointed out, something of an island. Um, what allowance have you made for maritime reservoir effects? Is it sometimes covered in fog? Um. I don't know. Uh, maybe this is a question for um, <laughs> for no, no, for for. Does the ladies want to answer the question? Well, I'm just wondering whether the island is covered in fog at some occasions. Covered in fog, 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 fog. fog. No, not, no. not 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 really. No, no. Thank you. If I I I don't. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hi, hi. Hi, Malcolm. Um, hi, well, I, unfortunately, I haven't spent enough time at Mitru uh, in the months outside of the summer to know how much fog there is. But <laughs> there's right in the sea, of course. Um, yeah, this is something that we, we have to look into is sort of a reservoir of carbon. Um, I mean, I don't know, because a number of our carbon-14 dates seem early. We have a bunch of uh, late halotic 2b early dates, which are from a destruction, and these are seeds from a, from a burnt destruction, and they're all fairly early. They go only till 40, 1431. Yeah. Uh, so there may be something to it, but uh, it would be nice to have actually data that can allow us to calibrate it. We have a bunch of uh, shell dates from Mitru, and they are much earlier than the seed dates. Um, so, so there is so certainly in the, there is uh, carbon in in the sea <laughs> that uh, make make the dates earlier there, uh, but we haven't published it and we haven't had the chance to really study them carefully. As you know, the one careful study showed an offset of four hundred sixty nine plus or minus eighty five years, 
Uh, so, yeah, as far yeah. as I understand it, it can it varies depending on yeah. where you are in the sea. If you're in the North European Gulf, which is a water that's you no know, doesn't stream very much. I mean, it's yeah. uh, it is. so. But but those dates are are early and middle Helladic. Uh, those shell dates, they're not late Helladic. But Thank you. Now, are there any more comments, uh, either online or in the hall?